Venice lies in the middle of a lagoon. It is not actually the sea, but an expanse of shallow waters separated from the sea by thin strips of land. The lagoon drains and fills up again with new sea water twice a day through the three inlets. The water flows in, the water flows out, flows in, flows out. But is Venice an island? It is a cluster of 124 islands, which were gradually populated starting in the 7th century AD. Venice did not grow out of a centre that expanded over time, but out of a series of settlements that coalesced into one. The main islands were originally independent settlements that had some characteristic elements in common. A church. A square, one or more rainwater collection wells, at least one canal at the edge of the square. If the canal is not visible, that means it was probably filled in at a later time. The Venetians have always had to conquer land from the lagoon and defend it from the water. The edges of the islands are clad in brick so that the land is not stolen away from the city by erosion. In many cases, large areas of the lagoon were filled in to create more space to build on. But defending the islands from the water is anything but easy. Over the years, the brick protection becomes less water-resistant and needs to be restored. How is that done? First, a section of the canal is isolated and drained. Then, the sediments that have accumulated on the bottom of the canal over the years are removed. During the second half of the 20th century, cleaning and maintenance on the canals was suspended for over 20 years, and as a result, many of the city's canals became impossible to navigate. The masonry protection along the banks is constantly under attack by the salt water that tends to make the bricks crumble and disintegrates the mortar between them. The tides that rise and fall every day and the vortexes of water created by the propellers of motorboats cause the loose bricks to fall. In the most serious cases, entire sections of wall need to be rebuilt. Often hydraulic bonding agents must be injected into the masonry to consolidate the wall mass. When the mortar dissolves, it causes even more serious damage. The wall ceases to be watertight. The water penetrates into it and washes away the earth behind the bricks. The city streets are called Calli, but they have other names too. Sometimes, because land to build on was so scarce, circulation paths had to pass under the buildings, or borrow space from the streets without reducing their width. Some streets are called salizzade because in previous centuries they were among the few to be paved. After the 17th century, public areas were paved with stones made of trachyte called masseni. Trachyte is a compact and durable stone. It has one great advantage. Even as it wears down, it stays rough. But trachyte does not last forever. Only the masseni that are worn beyond repair are replaced. Even the paving in Venice has historical value. 
It is a well-known fact that one of the city's problems is aqua alta. A higher-than-average tide is enough to flood entire areas of the city. When the paving is restored, in the lowest zones it is raised to a higher level. A few centimeters more or less can make the difference between going out in boots or not in order to get to work. Venice is an ancient city, but it is also a modern city. And like all modern cities, it needs electricity, water, telephone service, gas and street lighting. But where do all the cables and pipes in these grids run? Right under our feet, under the paving stones. When the paving is restored, it offers the opportunity to upgrade all the grid conduits, replacing the older or damaged ones. In some cases, the route they take under the paving stones is quite uncertain. And how do these pipes cross over from island to island? Just like people, they use the bridges. Venice does not have a complete modern sewage collection and treatment system. It still largely relies on the historical sewer system made out of masonry tunnels called gatoli. All the waste water ends up in these tunnels and from there drains into the canals. Twice a day, the tide in the lagoon exchanges the old water with new water from the sea. Many buildings have septic tanks tanks in which the wastewater settles and is treated before it drains back into the canals. But the sewer system made of gartoli and septic tanks must be kept efficient. Sometimes the gartoli become obstructed. The wastewaters put pressure on the masonry and risk causing entire sections of the embankment walls to collapse. There are 438 bridges in Venice. They are crucial to pedestrian circulation because they connect the various islands of which the city is composed. Until the end of the 18th century, there were not as many bridges and Venetians moved mainly on boats. When a bridge needed to be built, the problem, in some cases, became where to build it. The street system on many of the islands was already established, and often the ends of the streets on each side did not coincide. This is why some of the bridges in Venice are oblique. If the land that supports the foundations of the bridge cannot be consolidated, then it is better to build a wooden bridge which is much lighter than a stone bridge. A simple wooden bridge can save us a long walk, even though it requires frequent maintenance. But even stone bridges don't last forever. The keystones slip out of place. Cracks develop. The salt in the air damages the plaster, the bricks and the mortar. Venetian buildings are famous worldwide for their beauty and sophistication. In little more than a thousand years, the Venetians have codified a series of techniques for their buildings, developing ingenious solutions that are well adapted to their environment. The basic plan of the palace is based on the Casa Fondaco, the home warehouse, the typical residence of the merchant family. The ground floor served as a warehouse and a place where merchandise was bought and sold. The living space on the first floor, called the Portugo, served as the formal space. The attic floor under the roof held the apartments for the servants. The most important palaces have maintained the same basic structure. 
Life and work in the city took place mainly on boats. For this reason, the main facade of the Casa Fondogo faced the canal and not the inner streets. In many cases, the palaces had more than three floors, but the basic tripartite scheme remained the same. The portigo, which was often richly decorated, occupied the entire length of the piano nobile of the home. The floors were connected by an ingenious system of double stairwells. This way, the servants and the family had two separate entrances and two independent circulation systems inside the building. Several crossover points made it possible, when necessary, to switch from one system to the other. But how do such monumental buildings remain standing on ground that is as muddy and unstable as the earth on the islands of the lagoon? Before building the walls along the canal, the Venetians drove wooden piles into the earth in order to contain the ground and make it more secure. Then they laid two layers of thick boards over them and one layer of stone blocks. On top, they built the foundation walls. With a bit of imagination, it is not hard to interpret Venice as an upside-down forest. The palace was conceived in such a way that it could move and adapt to the uneven settling of the soft ground underneath. The palace can be imagined as a box in which the walls and floors are not rigidly tied into the perimeter. There are no rigid connections between the masonry parts. The walls simply rest against them, so that each individual part can move with respect to the others. The bearing walls of these buildings are almost always perpendicular to the canals. This way, they are the only walls that are actually bearing, meaning that they carry the load of the floors above. The facade, on the other hand, does not serve as a bearing wall. It therefore carries no load and can be pierced with many windows. Today, looking carefully at some of the buildings, you can see that the perimeter walls lean in slightly. In fact, when these walls settle, instead of opening outwards, they tend to lean in onto the roof and the floor structures thereby avoiding damage. The roof structures help close the box composed of the walls and floors. The floors and roof structures are made out of wood, a light and elastic material that resists change in the geometry of the building without breaking. At the moment of construction, or in later centuries, the floors were anchored to the walls with metal ties, which prevented the perimeter walls from collapsing outwards. But as time goes by, the ties can cause damage to the walls because the metal rusts, and the rust increases the volume of the ties, breaking the stone they use as a header. In all cities, humidity is one of the most serious problems for buildings, all the more so in Venice. Salt water evaporation, in fact, attacks construction material in the long run. The most damaging factor for brick buildings, however, is capillary rise. A wall is not much different from a sponge and absorbs the humidity of the foundations through the thin channels that run through it. The fact that the water is salty makes the situation particularly damaging. The salt seeps into the masonry dissolved in the water. The water evaporates from the wall, but the salt, on the other hand, becomes crystallized. 
Once it is crystallized, its volume increases up to 12 times, disintegrating the bricks. Even the wooden beams under the floors are damaged by humidity because the water makes it easier for fungi and bacteria to attack the wood. The traditional antidote was to add blocks of Istrian stone to the walls. This stone had served as a barrier against capillary rise. Today, however, the water level is higher than it was centuries ago. Therefore, the water laps against the buildings above the stone course and, as a result, the infiltration penetrates above the Istrian stone barrier. There are many solutions to capillary rise. One of them is to avoid plastering the lower part of the building so that the wall may continue to breathe. Another solution is called cutting the wall. The cut can be physical. In this case, a waterproof membrane is inserted into the wall to stop the moisture from rising. It can also be chemical. In this case, resins are injected to saturate the porosities in the masonry reducing permeability or even making the wall waterproof. It is easy to see that just above the level of the barrier, the wall is definitely less saturated with moisture. Humidity, erosion, the yielding terrain are all particular characteristics of the lagoon that the Venetians have always had to deal with. To continue living in such a changing environment, they have been capable of adapting to change and responding to the inevitable deterioration with constant maintenance and an appropriate use of the city. Venice is therefore the result of 1500 years of continuous transformation of its own urban landscape. With constant attention, it has been able to ensure its preservation over the centuries, and this is the only way it can continue to exist in the centuries to come. <laughs>